All right, welcome back. We're on the normal overhead view. Let's just keep working our way down the panel. So we've got the fire test here. So we've got APU, engine one, engine two. Now what do we need to do with this? Well, actually there's not a lot really. You just need to press the loop test and also the squib test, as I understand it. And you're just looking to see if it, it passes the self test, which is simply showing the ECAM and showing the noise. I'm not gonna do that right now. Uh, it should work, just feel free to press it. You'll see the firelight illuminate and you'll see the ECAMs that come up and you can cancel the master warning. It's as simple as that really. It's one of the tests that you do need to do. There are a lot of self-tests, not all of them need to be done every flight, but the reason that these need to be done is obviously you wanna see, does my fire detection system work before you start either an engine that you're gonna use, which hopefully is every single time, or an APU. So it would be illogical to start the APU before you've done an APU fire test because it might the, the, the fire system might not be working and then you're going to start the APU it's going to set on fire and you're not going to know about it pretty slim chance but you know always better safe than sorry reading light it simply is a light that illuminates on the pedestal so you can read <laughs> I don't really know just paperwork a book <laughs> whatever you feel like it, it, it illuminates that area now the fuel panel now, the fuel system on the A300 is quite complicated, to be perfectly honest. It's intuitive to use, I would say, but from a technical perspective, it's, it's quite complicated. So, what, what do we have going on here? Well, we've got engine 1, APU, engine 2, and we have all these different lines. So, remember we were saying about inline green? So, we can see that the engine 1 is connected, the APU is connected, and that the engine two is connected. Now, there's a little bit of a, um, I would say, simism that we did, for a good reason. So if I decide to pull the APU fire handle, you have to click and hold for three seconds. So we did that so that you can't inadvertently just pull the handle in flight and have a bad time. Now, do you see it says shut along this? So what has happened is the fuel valve to the APU has been shut. So it will obviously automatically shut down and there will be a auto shutdown ECAM and we have the fault light from the APU. Now we can just restow this and it, it should be it should be good to go. Uh, but yeah that's what we did sort of uh, you, the fact that you can reset it and go on your way. In reality it's not quite that easy but we don't want to punish people for sort of experimenting with a plane so that's just something to be aware of and, and now you can see it's gone back to inline green. What, what does inline green mean? I know we mentioned it before but it, it means basically the fuel can get to it. If it says shut then the fuel can't get to the APU and it's going to shut down. Shut down doesn't mean shut down it just means it's shut the valve. So engine 1 would be the same and engine 2 would be the same here. Personally quite a nice system that you can glance at the overhead panel analog wise and see what's going on. Again massive distrust of digital systems so you could diagnose if the valve is shut just from this panel. X feed stands for cross feed and oh sorry it's cross feed yeah cross feed is what it stands for so what does that mean why would we use it well normally both sides of the fuel system are separated with a valve now why would we want to do this pretty logical reason if you get a leak of fuel on one side you don't want all of the fuel leaking out so let's say we were flying along and we had a, a, a very nasty engine failure on engine number two so the right hand engine and a piece of it came out and hit the underside of one of the fuel tanks a, a very plausible situation that's happened many many times in commercial aviation of course the fuel is going to start to leak out of that tank and the engine is going to it's already blown up and failed but that's fair enough but the fuel's going to leak out to the atmosphere and we're going to lose it now if we didn't have a cross feed the fuel from the left side which is a perfectly functional engine would leak out of that hole that's on the right side of the plane so the cross feed basically cuts the fuel system in half if we push it you can see it's now connected in line green so now both sides of the fuel systems are connected and now they're separated standard is separated not connected for the reasons I just stated. Something that's not seen on other Airbus products that I'm aware of, at least the A320, is ISOL valves. What's an ISOL valve? It's an isolation valve. So it's to isolate this part of the fuel system. Why would you want to do this? No, I think personally this is a pretty good feature and a pretty nice system actually. So if you wanted to separate the outer tank 
from the rest of the system. I'm not 100% sure if they would actually do this in the case of a fuel leak, but to be honest, it would be logical. You can press this button and it's off, which is written in vertical. So now this part here of the fuel system is not attached to the rest of it because the isolation valve has been closed. So it's not going to leak out and it, you know, it's, it's, it's just separated from the rest of the system. And, and, and now that fuel is effectively unusable because it can't come out of the tank. Doesn't matter if the pump is on or the pump is off, it can't get out because the valve that's attaching, attaching it to the rest of the system is closed. You can do that for all of the all of these and of course you will now have access to no fuel. You might be asking yourself, would the engines run in this configuration? Well, it gets it's a little bit complicated so let's think about it again using the green lines it's as simple as that so I'm engine number one right and I want to get fuel so you go oh let's go down here oh no there's no fuel there because the isolation valves cough let's try another oh let's go oh no that one's cough and then it would get here and go oh that one's cough no I'm not gonna start because there's no fuel I'm like right let's open the crossfit oh, okay let me try this no oh no there's no fuel there oh no there's no fuel there so no they wouldn't they simply have no access to no fuel so if we did this, now engine number one will go, oh, oh no, no fuel, oh no fuel, oh no fuel, and it will go, oh yes, and these, it will get into, it will get the fuel from this tank here, and it will draw it through. Now you don't actually need the tank pumps running to run an engine. It's a common misconception. This is applicable to, uh, I would say, every airliner on the planet, and it's because gravity will naturally basically feed the engine. It's called gravity fuel feeding, clues in the name. Because the tanks are actually above the engine, so they naturally want to feed into it. This isn't the case with the center tank, because think about it, the center tank is lower in the aircraft, so gravity can't go uphill without some assistance. And if the pumps are off, it's not going to work. So simple as that. So let's turn all the isolation valves back on. Obviously, normal setup, you don't touch them, they're a guarded switch, they should be inline green, no issues. Let's put this back to the normal position, which is cut off and left alone. So what would we do for a normal startup? Well, there's a few things that you can do in this situation. So the APU, what is an APU? Uh, it's the auxiliary power unit. It's a small jet engine that's in the tail of the aircraft that gives us electrical power, air, air conditioning, air for starting the aircraft, and a few other auxiliary systems. So the APU has its own fuel pump in it, okay? So it can pump fuel from the tank, and it normally, normally, I say this, normally, <laughs> feeds from the inner tank, okay? Now, again, quite like this system, let's follow it. APU uh, normally feeds from the inner tank. It's going to work, okay? But if I turned this off, then it would go, oh, I can't get fuel. Oh, I can get fuel. So it would get fuel from here, okay? I know this is a little bit in depth, but if you can understand the premise of the fuel system here, it's, you're good to go. There's nothing else to say. This is this is a pretty in-depth part, but it's actually quite an important part of understanding the APU. So let's keep going with this. So the APU now can get this fuel from here. If we did this, it would go, oh, I can get it from here or here, but it's gonna go more than likely here because it's kind of closer, because we've, we've modeled fuel pressure in the tank, so it goes with the tank with the highest fuel pressure, or obviously the inner tank, which it normally goes for. So, and that will be, shown on the fuel display which tank it's going to draw from and that's all modeled which is pretty cool in my opinion back to the inner tank so i know i said that we're going to talk about sops but we'll talk about a little bit about sops normal operating procedure is to turn i believe it's either one or both so correct me if i'm wrong i guess you can't correct me but i'm sure you're sitting there going no it's pump one or no it's pump two but the premise is this you want the pumps to be on at least one of them, on the inner tank so 
that it can, so the APU doesn't have to run its own pump. Because remember we said that the APU has its own fuel pump, but you may as well not use that wearing it out if you've got a fuel pump in the tank anyway. So you just turn them on. So let's turn it on. We've got the fault light here. That's just because we did the shut thing. I said that. So it's a bit of a simism that, that because we've kind of failed it and then reset it, it's not quite happy, but it should start. So let me do that again. Turn it off. There you go. It recycled, so now we have no fault light. Again, a little bit of a simism. So if I turn these fuel pump off, turn this on, do you notice a difference? Are you observant enough? I probably wouldn't have, to be honest, but let's do it one more time so we can see what's going on. Okay. See, it has a low pressure light on the fuel pump here for the APU. So that's because it's having to spin its own fuel pump up to draw the fuel from the fuel tanks and for a moment it goes ah I've got low pressure and it shows that low pressure light but if we've already turned on the inner tank pumps we don't get the low pressure light because it doesn't have low pressure it doesn't have to spin its own pump up the fuel pumps in the tank are already on and you're good to go so let's step way back to the beginning of when we talked about the fuel system if you're just here to go, how do I turn this plane on? I don't care. Basically, if you want to start the APU, turn on the inner tank pumps. If you don't do that, it doesn't matter. It will start, but that is the standard operating procedure is to turn on the inner tank pumps or whichever tank is feeding the APU, and then you can start it. So, takeaway points. Isolation valves, cross feed should be left in the closed position, which it is by default turn on one of the inner tank pumps and then you can start the APU. If you want to start the APU at this point, we're going to, but depends on your flight. So, what's this fuel quantity indicator? Well, you know, fairly simple, just shows you how much fuel, outer, inner, outer, inner. These illuminate when you get below a certain threshold. They say, I believe they say low or low level. Yes, LO, just low, which is when you have a low level amount. And you get an associated ECAM for that. This says CTR slash TT. So this is how much fuel is in the center tank and the trim tank, but you only get one value on there. So it can be a little bit misleading. You think, oh, I've got six tons. Yeah, but two of it might be in the trim tank. We'll come to that a little bit later, or maybe, maybe we'll just leave it there actually, because this is getting a bit advanced. Moving down, uh, we've got the engine start section. Now, this is a bit different. Doesn't it look a bit different? A bit of trivia for you. If you go and look up an A380, they actually ran out of space where to put the engine mode selector. Now on, an, on a 320, 330, 340, this is called the engine mode selector and it's a little knob basically down by, by the thrust levers. Now here, it's on the overhead panel. I, when I first saw the A3, I was like, Shh, it's weird. Why is it on the overhead panel? It's, it's dumb. Well, it's not dumb, but it's just weird, right? But not really, because if you go and look at the A380, they ran out of room because it has four engines where to put it so they went aha we know where to put it we've done this before <laughs> so they just took the same knob to be honest i really 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 wouldn't be surprised if it's exactly the same part number because it looks identical put it on the overhead and gave it virtually the same function so i'll show an image on the screen now of the a380 so you can see there it's it's exactly the same how do we use this and what differences does it have okay this is going to be a little bit of a two-step process. We're going to talk about the functions, and then we're going to talk about it a bit more when we come to the engine start. Otherwise, it's going to be a bit too spread out. So, it has, from right to left, Cont Relight. What does this mean? Well, like a Boeing and an Airbus, whatever you want to say, Cont Relight means continuous ignition. It means that the igniters in the engines are sparking constantly like that every, I don't know, however, I'm not sure if it's milliseconds or seconds, I think it's seconds. So why would you use this? Now, for the A300, if you are using the general electric engines as we are today, you don't have to set this to cont for takeoff. But with the Pratt Whitney's, I believe you might. But again, read up on your own SOPs, but we're just going over what this is now. So Cont means it's it's click click clicking for a for a Boeing like a 7.3 like I said I mentioned I'm talking about a 7.3 here 
you use it for takeoff and approach in case anything goes wrong, the engine flames out and it can be restarted immediately because it's just happened that the igniters are going all the time. That's why it's used. In the Airbus world, they like to use cont as a sort of, uh, I think I might need it, so let me put it on. So if you're going to expect wind shear or a really contaminated runway, then you would use this, but that's what it does. Ignition off. No prize winners for that one, what it does. Means it's off. If anyone didn't get that, well, well done. The crank. Now, crank means it basically spins the engine without introducing the fuel, which you, which you have to do anyway manually, but it's sort of a maintenance setting, so it's fine. We'll just kind of skip over that. And then A and B. So you can see it says start with a little arc and then A and B. So you have igniters A and igniters B just two on seconds. both engines. You that's have an A and a B, and, and as for redundancy, in case one doesn't work, or one gets one out, or whatever, whatever, you have to. Again, dependent on SOPs, I think some people use an A on an odd day and a B on an even day, or every other engine start this swap. Obviously, it's in the sim, it, it doesn't matter because you choose whatever you want, it's going to start on A or B, so it's up to you. Uh, and that's what they do. Now, what happens with these, we've got start one and start two. These are the buttons that you basically press to get the engine to spin with air when we have it. Now we're gonna pause right here, we've done a bit of an overview, and we're gonna come back to the rest of it once we're doing the engine start, okay? I know it might seem a bit confusing, but we're gonna come back to it. And we're actually gonna step back a little bit more because it's a nice little bit of trivia here. So you can actually see that the fuel quantity is shown in kilos. On the EFB, if you change the setting to pounds, it will change it to pounds and the little label even changes to LBS. So you can see that we've got a little attention to detail there. So let's start the APU. We're finally starting something. We're like probably 35, 40 minutes into this video and we're actually going to start something. Amazing. but. It is a complicated plane and we're trying to cover everything here so you can have a bit of an understanding of the plane. You've seen that what we've done so far is I've done an awful lot of talking but not a lot of button pressing. So if you were just following this along, you basically just turn the white lights off and start the APU and do some fire tests. That's, that's the takeaway from this. So how do we start the APU and what effect does this have on the plane? So let's turn it off. A few things happen. So, have a look up here at the battery, see how they're just doing their thing, connected up. For the APU start, they automatically all get connected up. It's just the way the system works because the batteries actually assist with the APU start. It's an Airbus thing. 320, 330, 340, they do the same. Now, all we do to start is you wait three seconds after putting the switch on, just to let the system calm down. There's a thing called an ECB, electronic control box, and that needs three seconds to I don't know, think about it, <laughs> calm down, whatever you want to think, and you just press start. Now, the indications that we get are the on here, and the easiest place to look is the ECAM screen, and it will show X, it will show what's going on with the APU, but let's just focus on what indications we see on the overhead. Now, you see this blue, it's A-C-C-E-L, which stands for Excel, accelerate, like it's accelerating. So it means that the APU is spinning now, so it's accelerating, it's, it's doing its start cycle, and you don't have to press any buttons, it's just for information. That's, I believe, is like an A300 only sort of light. You're not gonna see it on many other Airbus products. So, there we go. So it's now started up, and can you see you have the avail light? So, avail, just like the external power, meant that, hey, I'm finished starting and I'm available now. So, we talked about the electrical system before, but I'm going to keep this as brief as possible because we're going to be here all day. There are priorities in the electrical system of the A300, so you don't have to manually turn the APU generator on. It's, it's already ready. So if I go, yo, I don't want, you know, I don't want the external power anymore. I've just turned the external power off, you heard the bus transfer, and now the APU is powering the airplane. And we're going to leave it like that for now on. The APU is going to power the plane, okay? So we could disconnect the external power now. There's 
the simple premise is there's no need to turn generators on and generators off in the A300. It's an automatic plane, just like the 320. Let's leave it at that. APU is now on, which is great. Normally, you'd probably put the APU bleeder on at this point. We're going to do that when we get there. To keep things simple, we're going to just tidy the rest of this up and put all of the fuel pumps on now. Not entirely the right thing to do, but I like to live dangerously, so it's fine. Let's move up a little bit, and you can actually see up at the top here that we've got the um, align modes flashing because they're basically saying, hey, what are you doing? Like, do, do you enjoy putting me into nav so I align myself and then talking for 35 minutes? So it's, it's after, I believe, it's after 10 minutes of being in a line, but you're not actually aligning it on the FMS, it, they start flashing. So you can see that's modeled, which is quite nice. Ventilation system, let's keep this as brief as simple. You don't need to do anything. It automatically does its stuff. It swaps from equipment cooling to inboard when the engine starts. You can manually change the settings here by turning stuff on and off. It all works the way it should do, but it's a pretty boring system, to be honest. It just does what it needs to do. Quickly, let's talk about cockpit door. So cockpit door, you can either unlock normal or lock and you can hear the, the lock goes on if you have the open light it means that the door didn't close properly uh, this panel over here is to do with the door we've got the strike top mid bot and chan which i believe stands for like chain but there's no chains but maybe it's channel I'm, I'm not sure one and two but i know i know what they do i just can't remember what chan stands for so you'll actually notice that this panel is a different color it's because it's from an A320 or it could be from a 330 but more than likely a 3 a th could be a 330 actually more likely because when the A300 came out there was no lockable cockpit door it was a different era where you didn't need it so basically they've retrofitted these from more modern Airbuses and that's why this is a slightly different color blue it's a bit lighter basically than the more modern Airbus blue this is quite a dark color in the uh, A300 flight deck but that's it no more needed to be set on those systems moving down you'd have already done this fire test main cargo detection again it's a it's a it's a test you hold the loop test you see that the stuff comes up on the screen you're good to go if you don't get anything then well it's not working turn these all on because as i said you want to make sure that you have no lights left on probe heat you can see that all of the different associated probe heats here window heater i believe Please check this. SOP wise, these are turned on at a slightly later stage because they can burn the elements out. But for simplicity, for this first start guide to getting you going in the aircraft, let's turn them on now. Let's get rid of those white lights and let's get on our way. Let's pan the camera down a little bit. Cabin pressure. Oh, now this is a complicated one. Basically, the whole system can be displayed in analog here and you can see you've got the outflow valves here which you can turn off which is strange but anyway you can do that this shows you your differential pressure up to 8 psi and then amber and red range these open and closed are the outflow valve positions what are the outflow valves and what do they do for us so we've got two valves on the a300 um, one kind of the middle, one at the rear, which you can see on the walk around. And what the simplest way to describe a pressurization system is you have a certain amount of air coming in the plane, and if you didn't let it out, the plane would blow up because it just builds up with pressure. So you have to let it out, but you have to let just the right amount out, otherwise it's not going to work. So to do that, you need to have an outflow valve or outflow valves, and they basically modulate themselves between in flight they're normally just a little bit open just to let a bit of air out and, and this is all modeled properly you can even pressurize the aircraft on the ground which is quite cool and let's give that a go very quickly so we need some air so let's turn the APU bleed on and please notice the gorgeous little change of sounds weirdly it does get quieter than louder that's actually correct according to our A300 line pilots so now the APU bleed is cooling the cabin and keeping us nice and cool but we've got some pressurized well not pressurized air we've got air coming in the cabin so let's keep going down before we start doing a manual pressurization we've got vertical speed which is the 
the vertical speed of the air in the cabin. We've got a manual pressurization button, which we're going to use in a minute, and we have an auto pressure rate limit. An absolutely bizarre knob. Uh, I'm please con get in contact with us. Why this exists, I don't know. But you can tell the plane when it's in automatic pressurization mode how quickly you want it to pressurize the plane. Personally, I want it to pressurize it so I don't pass out. That would be an ideal setting, but you can change it to min norm the light goes off high or max and these are all modeled they give you different pressurization uh, depressurization rates at uh, different things but when you see you move out of the norm knob you end up with this rate light on which shows that the rate is not normal but also it can be quite dangerous because if it's in min the plane won't pressurize quick enough at all and if you if you leave it like in min in the descent it won't depressurize it quick enough and you'll actually activate the safety valves which are there in case the plane gets too pressurized they pop open and depressurize the plane which is all models so what are these reg one reg two these are the cabin pressure regulator systems so we have one we can turn it off now did you notice that did you notice it maybe maybe okay so do you see that we've got one sys2 so this is system one and system two so i turned off the regulator for system one and it automatically switched to system two which makes sense doesn't it really because it's not working anymore so if i turn off if i turn it back on i turn this one off and it swaps the other way and you can hear the ecam coming up on the screen as well now you can select you can't turn them off it says push to select so you can swap the systems automatically by doing this or well manually but it will still be in automatic pressurization mode now if I press manual now I've taken full control of the pressurization system so you can see the arrow is pointing towards this which says oh you've got control and these are not working anymore so if I do this so if I went the right way it would help so now can you see that the outflow valves so these valves here are moving towards the closed position it takes 37 seconds sad that I remember that number to close the valves which is starting to happen slowly slowly it just takes a while like I said when I say a while I mean 37 seconds to be exact it's getting there it's getting there it's getting there and close Okay, you join me back about uh, 20 or 30 seconds later after I couldn't work out why the plane wasn't pressurizing, but I was bamboozled by my own system, or our own systems at INI builds, which is uh, always fun, but it's a good learning point, so I thought I'd show it off. So, well, why is the plane not pressurizing? I was thinking, that's weird, it should pressurize, uh, but that's because I've done something wrong. So, if you look here at the cabin pressurization page, uh, the vent overboard, it's open, so the Basically, the ventilation system is a big hole on the side of the plane that's open, which is completely normal on the ground. Um, but all the air is now coming out of that, so it's not pressurizing the plane. Okay, so now you can see the vent extract we're going to put to overboard. So that's now closing that system to the intermediate position, which is like the little bit open but not, not quite closed. Still isn't going to pressurize. And then we can turn this off. And then what it's doing is, dink, see it changed to the inboard, and voila. The plane is now pressurizing because the vent overboard has been closed. So we can actually view it on here and on here. So you can see that it's starting to build up pressure. The cabin altitude is starting to go down because we're on the ground and we're pressurizing the plane. So it's going negative, which makes sense. And it's building up pressure. So we've got 0.3 psi. It'll keep going. It'll keep going and going and going. If you leave it here for long enough, it will actually overpressurize the plane and burst this safety valve which will come open and depressurize the plane so if we just do this and this so now basically what we're doing is we're opening the valve back up again and the plane is going oh my god there's a big valve open all of a sudden and it's just starting to depressurize it also and it will return back to normal it's not the biggest hole in the world so it's going to just leak out at a certain rate and, and that's and that's what we can do we can put the system back into auto so now the automatic system will go oh my god what have you been doing you moron and we'll start opening up the uh, outboard outflow valves correction so you can see the forward and the aft outflow valve 
going into the fully open position because they're on the ground and we're nearly back to a normal pressurization. But what do you need to know about flying it if you just want to go from A to B, which is what this tutorial is all about? Nothing. Just make sure that you've got a little green triangle on one of these systems here and just make sure that none of this is turned off or in any, like we said, the lights out concept. Other than these green ones, you need to have one of these systems on. And you can't turn it off anyway, so that's it really. So let's move. Moving on to the top of the overhead here. Nearly done with the overhead panel. It's a, a mammoth of a task. Oxygen system, just make sure that it's on. If you turn it off, you see that the pressure drops. And also that, that if it's off, that's one of the reasons why you can't do your oxygen mask self-test. If it's off, you will not get the noise to come through it. If it's on, then you will. And you have the various pressurization or oxygen PSI levels here. Man override works, basically drops the mass in the courier area. They don't physically drop in the model, but it's modeled the delay in the system. It, it all works. Pack temperature. I don't really want to go into this into incredible detail because it's a very complicated system and is also a bit boring I think is maybe the right way to describe it but you can take manual control and you can actually control the pack outlet regulator temperature here by just opening and closing the valve it all works it was an incredible amount of work if I'm perfectly honest to get this to work properly also on a hot day the plane will heat up so about above 20 degrees Celsius it will get hotter and hotter until you turn on the APU bleed and cool it down or start the engines obviously get some sort of bleed air now let's step back a bit what is bleed air well it's hot air a bit contradicting myself there talking about cooling and hot air but I'll get to the point so it's hot reasonably high pressure air that comes from either the APU or the engines not from the air start unit because the air start unit can't cool the plane but it still gives you high pressure air to start the engines so we use this bleed air for cooling and we also use it for starting the plane so you either need the engines running or the APU on and the APU bleed on to get the cooling into the plane. So let's go down a little bit back to our normal overhead view for the final time. So here we are back on our normal overhead view. Isolation valve, it cuts off the system basically to the cabin air, the bulk cargo section. These, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, let's quickly bring up the Ecamm SD page up here so we can take a look. Okay, we've got the Ecamm SD page popped out now. And while we're here, let's talk about how we can resize these. So if you drag in the corner, they can get big, small, and you can see they're actually very high quality if you resize them due to the way that we have done the systems display uh, technology with INI builds on the A300. So what are we looking at here? kind of reasonably self-explanatory that's why I don't want to go too in-depth these are the different zones cockpit forward mid aft so we've got cockpit forward mid aft makes sense bolt cargo which is this one and you can change the temperature so I want to change the temperature in the cockpit I want it to be cold okay cold so now what happens is the trim air valve which is this thing here basically goes oh they want it colder I want cold so it asks for cold and this is called the duct temperature, so the duct that's coming in here. The temperature starts to get cooler coming in, which obviously means that the air in here, sort of overall temperature gets cooler. Very, very neat system. We modeled physically the sort of body of air and how much air comes into it and how long it will cool for. So it, it, will, it won't be instant. There's quite a few aircraft that it sort of instantly cools. That's not the case. Here it will take a while. So if we ask again for hot, so it will now go, oh, it doesn't want cold, it wants hot, but the valve will slowly start to react and it will go across to the hot and we'll start to heat up this area. And in auto, it basically keeps it at around about 24 degrees Celsius, which as you can see, well, funny enough, it's done that on all the other sections, which is pretty neat. So let's have a look at the rest of them. This little bit here is worth talking about it's a bit odd if i'm honest so you remember we said never trust screens is the a300 sort of motto here we're looking at all the information about the pressurization system but actually we've got most of it already just on the overhead panel you know you can see the green lines uh the temperatures and all this sort of stuff well can you see the temperatures you remember this and this temperature yes you can 
This is what this analog indicator does here. You can see this top one, I know it's quite small, but I don't want to zoom in. It says comped, and this one says duct. So this is the compartment temperature, and this is the duct temperature. So let's view this it one on there. How do we do that? So this rotary selector here, we move to cockpit, which is the one all the way on the end. So no, 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 all the way to cockpit. And now we can see on here, we've got a compartment temperature of around uh, 26, something like that, and a duct temperature of 50, which makes sense. And you can see on the screen, it puts these little amber X's. And it does that because it actually blanks out the sensor because you're now manually reading the sensor on that analog gauge. So there's a load of, they're called, I think they're called, in the A300, they're called SDACs which stands for, I think it's System Analog to Digital Convert... No, I'm actually not 100% sure. On the on more modern Airbus, it stands for System Data Acquisition Concentrator. Horrendous acronym, but never mind. It basically takes all the sensors and puts it into a screen so you can view it. Uh, and they, don't, they didn't trust it. So you can view it analog on here, which is what we're doing right now. But if where you want to leave this setting for a normal startup is in CRT. So CRT stands for I don't really care, I trust the system, please don't blank anything out because I want to view it on the screen, which they call a CRT. Kind of weird, CRT, uh, these screens are CRT screens, but to call it CRT is a bit weird, like in my opinion, I don't know why they just don't call it like SD page, or I guess they didn't have enough test space, but uh, anyway, CRT stands for cathode ray tube, which is a type of display technology they used in the 80s, which is what we have on this plane. So, we'll go over a few more functions uh, of this and we'll move on. We could spend a good 30 minutes talking about the system because it's incredibly complicated. And I'm pretty proud of the team, of, of how, f how well this is modelled because no one's going to use it, but it works properly. And I think that's hopefully what you can see after I finish this sort of enormously long overhead overview. But we're getting there, we're getting there. Right. Here we have ram air, pack valve, pack one valve. Again, pretty simple really. So you've got, this is showing inline green, so yes, we're connected to the system. This is inline green, yes, we're connected to the system. Ram air, if you turn it on, it's basically, if you've got no air left, you can open a duct on the bottom of the plane and it rams air into the air system. It's, it's normally used when you have a fire to blow the smoke through the system or various other things. You're not going to use it on the on the normal operations. But it, it is modeled and does work correctly. But you know, it's not going to be used much. Econ flow, max cool. Now these are used actually a lot. So considering this video is filmed on the freighter, often econ flow is selected. Now econ flow basically means that the cooling system is limited to 68% of its normal cooling capacity. Why would you do that? Why would anyone want to say, hey, I want a worse system? The reason is because with a, with a freighter, you haven't got a lot of heat in the cargo area, so there's not a lot of heat coming into the plane. Like on, on a normal passenger plane, people actually heat up the plane a lot, like, like a lot actually and you need a lot of cooling just to remove that heat. And on a freighter, you, you don't really need it. So you can put econ flow on and the whole system is limited to 68%, but it only really affects when the engines are running. So you press this button so it's not cooling as hard, so it doesn't actually tax or doesn't like use the engines as much, kind of, basically, to, to cool, so that you save a tiny bit of fuel. So it's basically a fuel saving measure. Max cool, so even though I said max cool, it actually makes the, the thing hotter, but fair enough. What it means is it adjusts the limits for cooling. So if you remember before, we looked at our cockpit temperature. So look, it's already gone up to 29, we've got 31 in there. So now I want it to as cool as you can go. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna go, the duct temperature is gonna be colder than it was before because the limits have been adjusted lower so let's go over that again what does max cool do it basically means it can means it can cool the plane quicker so if it's really really hot and you think oh my god it's so hot i need to cool this down pop max cool on it's going to cool the plane 
as quick as it can. That's basically what it's going to do. So you can see, look, one, three, four, it's actually going to go into the minus, minus temperatures and really bring the temperature of this down. So let's just leave it doing that. Moving on, we've got this little gauge here. This shows you the pressure in the system, so we don't actually have to look at the ECAM again. Never trust screens. And that's about it for the compartment temperature. So why don't we just remove this little ECAM SD page and continue on with our overview. Right, back on the overhead. So we'll leave this cooling. Actually, we'll leave the little selector in cockpit so you can keep an eye on this. So you should be able to see it dropping the temperature slowly and the duct temperature staying pretty low. I know it. I know this is a long video. <laughs> it's long for me as well, but we're getting there. We're getting there. This is by far the most complicated video we're going to do. The rest of them are going to be bish bash bosh. Let's go. But I hope you get in a sort of an idea that if you don't want to hear me rambling, just turn all the lights off, start the APU, put the bleed on, and then that's basically what we're what we're summarising so far. So, air bleed. What does it do? Why do we care? Well. It's to do with the bleed system. You can see we have a cross feed here, so it's like a cross connecting the air systems. So remember we said like the fuel system, you can separate them. You can do the same here, but you need to click this button that puts it into manual and then toggle it. Now, did you see the fault light come on on this side? And actually you can hear that pack two, so the right hand side, has stopped functioning. So we've lost sort of half our cooling ability, but, but pack one can cool the plane, no issues at all, that, that's fine and that's because we've closed this valve so the air that's coming in from the APU so let's follow our little line along APU bleeds coming here it's coming here and it goes oh oh it's not there so it can't get there anymore so it, it doesn't work but it can go up here and that's fine put it back into auto should take a few seconds and it goes oh there we go and it connects back up and you can hear it coming back on neat little feature neat little system these are the bleed valves so these are the valves that come from the engine the engine bleed remember we were saying the hot high pressure air if we turn these off then you won't get any bleed air from the engines uh, you do that for some sort of some starting procedures but not a normal start so we'll leave them on high pressure HP valve same thing high pressure bleed air but it's the same thing and this isn't actually a button it's an indicator to show that it's inline green if we turn it off then it goes not in line green and we can see that the fault lights are shown on the packs because there's no air coming through them basically emergency exits put it to arm and the compass light is just a light for looking at ice and stuff so we don't have to worry about that now if any of you are sensitive to noise i'm going to warn you something very weird is going to happen that i was extremely confused at the first time i did it and thought no way can that be right but it is right. So, ready? Room share. Room share. Room share. Okay, now that's finished. Let's talk about what just happened there. So this is the enunciator light test. And it basically does what you'd expect. It just illuminates all the lights so we can check to see if they all work. But what are we really looking for? We'll, we'll get back to the noise in a second. What we're actually looking for is up here. Can you see that the strike plates... I said we'd come back to this. I didn't forget that they would all be illuminated because we basically want to be able to see does our door, is it going to tell us when they're broken because it's kind of important. For a cargo plane, eh, it's not as important as a passenger plane but that's what we're looking for. The rest of them is just nice and pretty. But you must have heard that wind shear, wind shear, wind shear. It's done three times when you do the enunciator light test. Very odd but that's the way they did it. So it's modelled and that, that's what it does. So you can have endless fun going <laughs> <laughs> See, so you can you can really play with it, but yeah, that's what it does. It's a pretty strange system, I'm going to be honest with you, but uh, yeah, it works. But you can see here that the temperature is already coming down the cockpit. Now, we are finally nearly there, nearly there. One last thing we're going to come back to. Engine start. We said we were going to talk about how do we start this engine, what does this do? Well, once we do the engine start part of this tutorial, we're going to fully go over it, but now we've got some bleed air, let's talk about it a bit more. So if I move it to crank, or A, let's put it on A, okay. Do you hear that the audio has changed? That's because, look at the packs, 
they've turned off okay now in a 737 when you want to start the engines you have to turn off the packs so that you have enough air going into the engine for it to start you don't have to do that on the on the a300 it's actually smart enough to go if you're telling me that I'm going to start the engine I'm going to automatically turn it off so if I put this back to off there you go see you can hear them coming up and they connect back up if I put it back to A or B doesn't matter let's use B you can see them go off and hear them go off so let's not do it because we're not ready to start the engines yet clearly but if we click this button here so we you can see it says arm arm so that's saying hey I have bleed air behind me this valve and I'm ready to go I'm armed if I click it the light will go blue and it will say open and the engine will start spinning around now what we have to do is you have to wait till about 20% N1 and then introduce the fuel and the engine will start the A300 has a kind of a FADEC but not really it's more like a 7.3 so it's not really FADEC equipped it's not going to do auto shutdowns or all this sort of stuff so it's more of a more of a manual start procedure in fact let's just say it doesn't have a FADEC it's, it's, it's a manual start every time which is different from the 320 it's uh, quite a significant difference because the 320 will auto start and auto shut down and auto crank itself and whatever it needs to do but with this you've got to pay a bit more attention so procedure move the engine start selector to A B packs will automatically turn off you click the button for the engine you want to start it will spool up and you will put the fuel in. I incorrectly said N1 before, it's N2. You're looking for 20% N2, so N2. Good catch if someone's now furiously typing an email, but they got to this point and thought, ah, oh, they already caught it. There you go. <laughs> just, just checking you're still with me. No, I'm not really, I made a mistake, it's fine. And you put the fuel in and it starts. Yep, we'll come to it later. Let's go to the off position. I think for the first part of this video, that's about enough. We'll warn the next part of the video, we're going to talk about the FCU and the pedestal, which they're not going to be anywhere near as long as this because we basically talked about every single system on the plane. And then we're going to talk a little bit about the EFB and then we're going to start the engine. And that might be another video in its own right actually as well. So thank you very much for watching. I'm going to leave it here. It's uh, pretty long so far, but stick with it. Things to take away from it. Are you want to make sure all the lights are off you want to start the APU at some point you want to put the APU bleed on which is here we've talked about APU start we've talked about how you get external power and if you want to start the APU at the beginning clearly then you don't need to start it later on do the fire test uh, before you start anything and then you're good to go from this point onwards okay and we'll catch you in the next episode thank you very much